All glory, honor, and praise to the one true God. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Wonderful music today, taking us to the throne of glory. Well, for all of our guests out there, we have a few. We want to say welcome to Village Baptist OKC. We're grateful that you are in the house of the Lord. I'm Brother Ryan. I have the privilege of being the under shepherd here. And uh, we are just blessed that you are our guest today. And you notice a little slip there in your uh, in your uh, pew there in front of you. Just grab that. Just fill that out. We just want to get to know you, get to know your family, and know how we can pray for you. And we're just excited to be in the house of the Lord. We are a text-driven community. That means that we believe in the inspired and errant and infallible Word of God. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to study the Word of God together. Please take your Bibles and open up to you. Genesis chapter 3, Genesis the third chapter. As you do, remember God the Father loves you and wishes to teach you something through the investigation of his word this morning. We have just gone headlong right here in to the book of Genesis and we've started this series called Vistas, Christ and all the Old Testament. And we've been looking really kind of at the first things, if you will. In the beginning, God, those four words determine your worship, your worldview, and your work. Basically, your life, your worship, your worldview, and your work all flow from what you do with, in the beginning, God. Then we looked, of course, at the created order. God is a good creator. The Bible makes it very clear that this God is not nefarious. He's not weak. He doesn't lack knowledge. This God that we serve is a good God. He is a full God. He is a perfect God. And it follows that all that he creates is good. We looked at his unspeakable pre-existence that he has always been, that the God that we know as creator stands outside of the created order. Nothing created God. It follows that he is supreme. So his unspeakable pre-existence is unrivaled power in the created order and speaking creation out of nothing in the created order. And then ultimately his ultimate purpose to be good, to demonstrate his goodness, his love to you and I as the creatures. Uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, in noting the kind of the, the nature of God, his, 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 uh, his good nature, and that all of the universe, every created thing, worship him. He says this, he says, does not all of nature around me praise God, kind of echoing Psalm 19 and verse 1, the very heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, Spurgeon goes on to say, if I were to be silent, I should be an exception in all the universe. God has created us to worship him. And we have learned as human beings, we are the apex of creation. As beautiful as the stars are, as beautiful as the expanse of space and all that that can bring us and all the, the beauty, as beautiful as the flower and the, the flowers and the, the, the physical created order around us here on earth, um, all of that is important and wonderful. Even the angels, as powerful as they are, they are important, they are wonderful, they are beautiful. But they are not the apex of creation. You and I are. We have been created with the special capacity we call the image of God. We alone have this capacity to be in personal relationship with God. Last week we saw God's handiwork, that it's complete. We saw his heart, that he is compassionate. We saw his, uh, his hindering power, that he gives us commands to protect us and to bless us. Even all the way back there in the beginning, there in the Garden of Eden. And then ultimately we see his help, his commitment to help us, to bless us, to be with us. This is a God who is involved with his creation. Speaking of the image of God, you remember what I shared with you from uh, Billy Graham last week regarding the image of God. Just to kind of put some teeth on it so you understand what the image of God in you is. He says, the Bible tells us that we are not just animals. We are made in the image of God. That is, God implanted within us, each one of us, something of himself. And we might say, to kind of clarify that further, this is the, the capacity that we can be in personal relationship with the Holy God. Even the angels, the Bible tells us, the angels long to kind of look into the things that you and I experience with the one true God. Okay, and so this is the, the one true God that we serve. He is a good creator. Today we're going to learn about the fall and the first gospel. A great uh, Christian theologian from uh, the 18th century, Charles Simeon, said this. He said this in your point to ponder. Genesis 3.15, which we'll look at 
uh, very clearly today, is the sum and the summary of the whole Bible. There, even at the beginning of all things, we see God has made his purpose known for us. Genesis 3.15 is the sum and the summary of the whole Bible. And as we looked at last week, the God of the Bible is a personal God. I shared that that Hebrew structure, that Hebrew configuration with you from last week, Yahweh Elohim. There it is on your, on your screen. In Hebrew, you read right to left. So that first word right there is Yahweh on the right side to you. And then Elohim. Okay, this is the personal God. This isn't just kind of superficial God. This is not just kind of God in name only and, and distant God. This is the, the, the personal God. And this God of the Bible is a personal God, a God who is involved with, with us. And we see that right here in the first gospel. Uh, I know often we look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John as the, the primary gospels. But here in Genesis chapter 3 today, we learn that the gospel is already present all the way back at the beginning of our existence. And so that's what we're going to focus on today as we look at the fallen nature of man and the first gospel. Please stand in order of God's, in honor of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant and infallible word. Looking at Genesis, and we're actually going to read just Genesis 3 and verse 15 to kind of kick us off today. This will be kind of the primary point. The sermon in a sentence is found right here in the first gospel of Genesis 3 and verse 15. This is Yahweh, this personal God that we just were speaking about. Yahweh Elohim, he is, he is addressing Adam and Eve. He's addressing the serpent. He's, address, he's addressing this situation that has just occurred. The fall has just occurred. Sin has entered into the created order. And this is Yahweh, this is Yahweh speaking. This is what he says in verse 15. He says, And I will put enmity, great separation, war, basically. I will put enmity and war between you and the woman. He's addressing the serpent. I will put the uh, put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed, the seed of the serpent, which will ultimately uh, be uh, revealed in the Antichrist, in the spirit of Antichrist. He says that between your seed and her seed. Notice this. Uh, he shall bruise you on the head or, or crush you on the head. The, the seed of the woman will crush, will ultimately crush the, the, the seed of the serpent. And of course, the serpent we know is emblematic and is actually a, an actual physical manifestation of Satan himself. Somehow Satan has embodied this serpent. So Yahweh says to the serpent, this seed of the woman shall bruise you, or a better translation, crush you on the head, will crush your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Notice that. That is the first gospel, if you will. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we are so grateful today for who we are in Christ. As the song that we just got to, to hear, we are here for your glory. We exist because of you, not the other way around. We are here for you. We pray that today as we study your word, as we investigate your word. I pray that right now that you would remove me. I pray that it is the power and the presence, the person of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, that will illuminate our hearts and minds right now. Spotlight the text. Apply the word of God to our hearts that we might go and live it, that we might not only have it in our head, but it will translate to really what we believe in our heart. And now it's going to extend to our, our hands, head, heart, and hands. Father God, do your good and sovereign work today. We are here for you, for your glory. And I pray that you would teach us by your spirit in your word right now that we are fallen creatures and yet even there at the very beginning in your sovereign good plan, you already knew that you were going to provide a remedy for our sin, the wages of sin and death. It is your son. It is the seed of the woman. And we thank you for this one that we call Messiah, Jesus Christ, who was present all the way back there in the Garden of Eden. Father God, be blessed and say in all that we do today, be honored and glorified, get all the glory. We pray this in the great name of the sovereign monarch, Jesus Christ. All of God's people said, you may be seated. Again, to our guest, welcome. Uh, if you'd like to take some notes, 
Hopefully you've got a bulletin. If you don't have a bulletin, you can raise your hand. One of our ushers will get you that. But we like to kind of fill out some lines so we kind of track along with the text of Scripture. Your life point for today is quite simple. Even in the immediate moments after the fall, there at the very beginning uh, following the fall, God the Father had already mapped out His sovereign plan of redemption in and through God the Son, Jesus Christ. Christ. Again, the goodness of this creator is put on full display. Not only is he a God that creates good things and does good things, but even after man has fallen, even after he has given explicit warning uh, to, uh, for Adam and Eve what they should not do, and yet they do exactly what they are not supposed to do, God is there on the scene providing himself, providing his son. God the Father already had mapped out his sovereign plan of redemption. What is redemption? It is a sweet word. It's being bought back. You and I are slaves in our sin. I know that word slave, it's very charged in our day and age and certainly in our own own history as a country. And we should take note of that. But even beyond that, we see that we are slaves to sin. If we don't follow the way of God, we are slaves to sin. We need to be bought back into the family of God. We need to receive redemption from God. And God is the one that he himself, he redeems us and he provides the one who does bring us back into a relationship with himself, a reconciled relationship, his own dear son, Jesus Christ, even in the immediate moments of the fall. Think about this. Think about the loving nature of this holy God that we serve. He is so loving. He created us even knowing that we would sin against him. He is all-knowing. He does know all things, and yet he created you and I. That's a demonstration of his goodness and his love, that we would have the opportunity to exist and be in relationship with the holy God. But not only does he create us knowing that we'll sin, he provides a remedy, and that remedy is redemption in and through his own son, Jesus Christ. But it stands to reason, and it is very obvious in our day and age, we see it right now, this man who calls him one that is strong all the way across the seas there in Russia, He believes he is strong. All I see is the embodiment of evil. I see the sin nature that is on full display. And you and I, we we can point the finger at that man over there, that monster there in Russia that is going after innocents there in Ukraine. And we continue to pray for the people of that nation of Ukraine and the surrounding areas against this evil man. But one thing we can make sure and be very clear of in ourselves is that we too have a sin nature. We are fallen in our own sin nature. I want to have a little bit of fun with you. I want to, I want to demonstrate to you that you have a sin nature. And some of y'all are guilty of some of these things. Uh, l- let me look at this list. Uh, this list, I am not guilty. This is one of the few things I'm not guilty of. But you, some of y'all are guilty of this. Number one, some of y'all are still choosing Chevys over Fords. This is, this is uh, absurd. When you look at a Chevy and you see another Chevy on the side of the road, and there it is just lying dead, and the people are just whizzing by on the Fords. You could buy a Ford. You could have a Ford. You could be one of the elect and have a Ford. <laughs> Someone has a little acronym for Ford. I don't see that uh, add up all that much, all right? Some of y'all are choosing Chevys over Fords. That is a demonstration of your fallen sin nature. Some of y'all are still choosing unsweet tea over sweet tea. I, for the life of me, I do not understand how anyone could take pond water and call it tea and drink it. I could go, I could go down to the muddy river and get a glass of it and call it unsweet tea. And you'll notice there on the screen it says, this is how you drink unsweet tea. You pour it out. And then you take the glass and you throw it away. Some of y'all are demonstrating the sin nature by continuing to drink unsweet tea. And you can see on the other side, you can see that sweet tea. It's actually sweet tea because that beautiful film of sugar is right there at the top of the mason jar, right? 
Some of y'all, and this one hurts to to admit for some of y'all, some of y'all are still choosing mayonnaise and putting mayonnaise on your burgers when barbecue sauce is readily available. Mustard is readily available. We are in no shortage of these things, and yet you continue to choose mayonnaise. This is a demonstration of your own fallen nature. My good friend, Eugenia, knows to hide and, and turn those mayonnaise jars over in the fridge because I have been known to throw them away if I see them. I get so grossed out by them, I will take them and I'll throw them away. Some of y'all are still choosing mayonnaise when you could have barbecue sauce. Now we're getting kind of serious. The next one really is a demonstration of the sin nature. Some of y'all, unfortunately, some of y'all are short horn fans. And I, I, I will never understand this, okay? I, I presume there probably will be some redeemed uh, short horn fans in heaven. But I have a sneaky suspicion that the Lord will put them in the very back of the throne room, where, okay? They're going to be on the back seat there in heaven. And the Sooner fans and the Oklahoma State fans, we're going to be right there up at the front of the, the throne of glory. We're going to be there together. But some of y'all demonstrate the sin nature in the choosing of your college football team. There you go. Okay, all right. There are some Cowboy fans in here. Lastly, I want you to share, I want to share a picture with you. There was an assassination attempt on the pastor's life earlier this week. It is no secret that I am the rummager of the, of the, of the fridge, okay, here at church. I, instead of taking a, a lunch break, I, I just go right to our fridge, and whatever has not been eaten, I will partake of that, and, and I just don't want to waste anything. Well, I opened up what I thought were hamburger patties, and I was going to use barbecue sauce and mustard just as the Lord intended. I was all excited for my little makeshift meal. And once I opened up the sack, there was a waft of a very corrupt smell that, that came from the back. If you don't know what these are, these are called Boca Burgers, okay? And I was introduced to Boca Burgers early on in my relationship with Stacy. And Stacy had some Boca Burgers in the fridge. I had no idea what they were. I thought they were frozen patties. And I made, I, you know, I heated it up, whatever, and I took a bite of it, and I about died. And then when my wife got home, I asked her, I said, what have I done for you to hate me? What, 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 what have I done? I know I'm not a great husband. I know that I am not a great pastor. But what have I done, y'all, that would deserve Boker Burgers, okay? Some of us demonstrate over and over that we have a sinful and depraved nature. And I wanted to have a little bit of fun with you before we got serious. Because sin is no laughing matter. The depraved nature is no laughing matter. In fact, today, countless will die. They will physically die and because of their sin and because of their refusal to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, they will step out into eternity, into eternal torment. The reality of sin is no laughing matter. And so today we look at the sin nature. We look at the sin nature that is present all the way back at the beginning of all things. First thing I want you to see from our text today is a sin nature, a propensity to lie listening. You and I, because of sin, because of our sin nature, it's natural for us to partake in lies. Not only share lies and spread gossip and lies, but also to listen to lies. When it's, when it's so obvious that it is a lie, we, we, because of our sin nature, because of the fallenness of our mind, we have a propensity to lie listening. Look all the way back there at the first couple of verses of Genesis chapter 3. Verses 1 through 5 will be our first unit. Um, the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to recount this, uh, this scene of the fall of man back there in the Garden of Eden. In verse 1 of Genesis chapter 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field. Notice that. Which Yahweh God had made, and he said to the woman, the serpent said to the woman, Indeed has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, You surely shall not die. That is a lie. Verse 5. 
For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. A sin nature drives us to have a propensity to lie listening. We learn from the text that this serpent is subtle. The word for subtle there, arum, in the Hebrew is the same. It's actually the same root where we get the word earlier in Genesis chapter 2 for the word naked. There's a, a, a kind of a, an aspect of being vulnerable and open. And so this, this uh, serpent that is talking, which, by the way, is already a demonstration of a denial of its function, okay? In Genesis 1 and verse 25, we know that the Bible tells us that the, the, the animals were made to their kind. We don't get any sense that they, in and of themselves, had speaking ability, as you and I would understand, speaking and sharing. So the enemy has entered into this serpent, this creature, and now the enemy, the devil, is speaking through this serpent. By the way, chronologically, it probably indicates that the, the, the angels have already had their little, little coup in heaven, and they are now in the dungeon depths of a realm that God created called hell for them. And so now the devil is roaming the earth, and he is looking subtly, sneakily to, uh, to trick and to lie to human beings, to these creatures who are the apex of humanity. Notice that the question that the serpent asked, he, he cast doubt on the very nature of God right from the, the beginning. Uh, look, look again. Uh, there in verse 1, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. With the implication here that the serpent or the devil is, is, is querying the woman is that, that, that God is, is restraining, that he is providing too many rules and regulations, that he is full of stricture, and that he is, he is holding back. He doesn't want them to be totally free. And you, of course, we learned last week when God gave that command that hindrance not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That was actually a blessing and a demonstration of grace to Adam and Eve, that they would not partake, that they wouldn't fall into a sin nature. But now that the sin nature is here, there is a propensity, a tendency to listen to lies. Notice that when the serpent talks back to when he, he mentions God there in uh, verse, the tail end of verse 1. Indeed, God has said. He uses the word Elohim there. He doesn't use the personal nature of God. We have seen kind of the residence of the personal name for God, especially at the, uh, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 2, speaking of this good creator who is involved. And what, what, the, what the, the serpent, what the devil wants to do is he wants to create this false dichotomy that, that, that God is distant from them, that God is not close to them, that God is, God is just, just about rules and regulations and he doesn't really care about their well-being. Everything up until that point would demonstrate that this is ultimately a lie, but the sin nature demonstrates that we have a tendency and propensity to lie listening. Notice that the woman, she engages. At this point, she is not yet named Eve, by the way. She is woman. She doesn't need any other name. She is the, the perfect, suitable helper for Adam, the man, and she is the woman, for she has come out of man. And the woman engages the enemy, engages the serpent. And in her response, she actually kind of neuters and kind of weakens what God had already told them. Number one, she doesn't mention that all of the trees except the tree of the uh, a tree of knowledge of good and evil is available she just says notice there and then one said to the serpent from the fruit of the trees of all the garden we may eat she took she left out all previously when the command had been given to to adam god god was showing that he was gracious i'm giving you all of this but you will not partake of this particular tree eve is already wavering she is already Doubting, the woman is already doubting and wavering. And then she notes that least we die, as if it's as if it's still a possibility that they may not die if they partake of the tree. Look at the tail end of verse three. 
but from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it, lest you die. Well, when, when Yahweh spoke to them, what did he say? He says, you're surely going to die. You are going to die. It's not a ma- This isn't, this isn't a, 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 an if. This is a when. You are going to die if you fall into sin. And here is the principle that we take. Whenever we engage the devil on his own terms, whenever we, we uh, engage sin, we uh, have a, a wavering of trust of our own relationship with God. Whenever we engage the devil in sin, trust wavers. Our trust wavers. Whenever we listen to the sinful nature of our own hearts, whenever we listen to the, the, the fallen moorings of the world and the fallen philosophies of the world, whenever we listen to Satan and perhaps even some of his minions uh, themselves, we are allowing ourselves to waver in our trust of the one true God. Notice that there is no halfway for this one called the serpent. This enemy, he brings forth the lie. And in the lie, the consequences are depravity, destruction, and death. The three Ds, that's what the enemy, that's what sin brings in to your life. Depravity, destruction, and death. There is no other recourse. That is where you and I are headed in our sin. And the lie, of course, casts doubt on God's goodness. Look at verse 5. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the serpent is essentially saying, you know, God is this powerful being, but he's kind of insecure, and he doesn't want you to have the same knowledge and power that he has. How absurd, again, that the creature could ever believe. If you ever think you could ever be on par with the holy, sovereign, omnipotent God, you forgot in the beginning God. you got to go back to the first four words. It all flows from that, our worship, our worldview, ultimately our work, ultimately our, our life. But the lie casts doubt on God's goodness. When, whenever you and I, in our sin nature, we, we, we give in to the devil's uh, ways in our life and we give in to the sin nature, it's, it's like we're saying to God, we're saying, God, you're not good enough for me. I know what you have demonstrated to me and you've shown me over and over. Don't we say that about, about consistency? If someone does something over and over and they do that to a high level, don't we have some trust that they're going to achieve and accomplish that again? Well, God has never failed. Why would we ever doubt that he is anything but 110% consistent? The lie cast out on God's goodness. And because of the sin nature, there is lie listening. Not only lie listening, the sin nature brings forth the problem of life lostness. Look at verses uh, 6 through 8. A problem in life lostness. And by the way, I chose the instrumental there in very purposefully because when you're in something, it's almost like you can't get out of it. You are located in that. You and I are located in our sin and basically a a reality and existence of being lost. We need direction. Look at verses 6 through 8 of Genesis chapter 3. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable, notice this, to make one wise, she took from its fruit and she ate. And she also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So all along, Adam is right there. Adam is present. He is watching this, and he says nothing. He had been given the task of stewarding and overseeing the garden, even being over Eve in a loving and godly way. And yet, right here at the beginning, the passive nature of man. Isn't that what we see when men, when men are passive, evil prevails? It always happens. It is a maxim. It is a truism of this economy that we call life. But the man is right there, and she gave some to her husband with her, and he ate. Verse 7, then the eyes of both of them, notice, notice this, they were open. Not in a good way, by the way. The eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Previously, they were naked. They saw each other totally without any clothing, and they were perfectly comfortable. There was no need to be self-conscious about their bodies or, or their sexual organs or their bodies in general. They were perfectly in harmony. 
It was just as it should be, no shame. And now shame and guilt is present right here in the moment. Their eyes have been opened and they understand that they are naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings, verse 8. And they heard the sound of Yahweh God. Notice again, okay, in juxtaposition to the serpent who has mentioned only Elohim, only this kind of distant, impersonal God. Now the personal God is back on the scene. Yahweh himself is there with them, even in their sin. This is good news for you and I. They heard the sound of Yahweh God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and in the man and his wife, they hid themselves from the presence of Yahweh God among the trees of the garden. Life lostness here in the prevalence of sin when sin has now been injected and infused. And by the way, that is perfectly biblical to think of sin as a disease. It is a spiritual disease and it impacts everything. I know we're worried about cancer. We're worried still, some people are still worried about COVID and some of the things that relate to that. We're worried about all these diseases in our world and in our land. But can I tell you, the root of all of it is sin. It would not be here. None of those things would be here without sin. That's why it is here. And there is a, from the text, we see a, a fourfold process in regards to sin. First of all, the Bible tells us that the woman, she saw it. There was sight. There's four S's that I want you to share. You know, I like to alliterate. I try to make it as easy as possible. Under the heading of sin, put sin. And then draw a line under sin. And put sight, satisfaction, satiation, that's a big word, and then shared. First of all, she sees the fruit. She sees it. And it is, it is something that is pleasing to her eyes. The tree was good for food. Notice that. There was something about the, about the fruit. And I don't think this is an apple, by the way, okay? Uh, this, is, this is something quite unique. We, 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 we kind of diminish and downgrade how often we have been influenced by art over the ages. But there is something about this fruit on this tree that it was good for food. And notice this, it was a delight to the eyes. She saw it. That's where it starts. Whenever sin comes into our, our kind of our, our person, it always begins with sight. And then there's the, the ruminating. We have a, a picture of what it could be if I had that thing, if I had that, that, that item. This is what is in my mind. It's sight. It's good for the eyes. It's a delight to the eyes. Notice that. And then notice this. That it was desirable to make one wise. There's the satisfaction. She was looking to be satisfied. She, she felt like she needed something more. She absolutely needed nothing more. She had all that she needed. Adam had all that they needed right there. And yet there was something in the, the sin nature that says, more, give me more. I want to be satisfied. It's always, again, about me and the focus is off of God. That's what sin does. Sin takes my eye line and your line and it points it back at self and it, and, and it takes it off of God. So we see that the sight is there and it's good for food. And then she wants to, she desires it and so she wants to satisfy herself. And then she actually takes a bite and she is satiated. Her, her, her desire, her satisfaction, her desire to be gratified, it is, it is satiated. That, that is met in her, and yet it is just for one fleeting moment. It is a great reminder. Oh, sin will always take us further than we ever anticipated. It will cost us more than we would ever expect. For one small moment of what we believe to be satiation or gratisfa gratisfaction, that to be gratified, to be gratified by the by the the sin nature, it is so fleeting. So she sees it, and she is wanting to be satisfied, and so she satiates her, her desire, and she is gratified in that moment. And yet, that is not the end of the story. It's a great reminder that sin is always, even in the quietness of your own heart, I don't care if you have one dark room in your home, and you can go in there, and you can shut the door, and you can lock the door, and you can sin, and you can do all you want. Sin is never about an individual. It is always corporate. It is always shared every time there Adam is overseeing she gave some to her husband and he also ate I'm guessing that Adam in that moment was 
was waiting for her maybe to, to combust. And of course, he didn't have any sort of uh, referent for that. But he's wondering what is going to happen to her. He's like, if you're going to do it, better you than me. All right, this is the consummate not strong man. This is a passive man. If someone's going to get hurt, it's going to be you, woman. It's not going to be me. And then she partakes of it. She doesn't combust. There is not uh, thunder and lightning that, it, uh, that are cracking all, all around. And it appears like it's okay. So yeah, yeah. Are you enjoying that? Does that taste good? Uh, let me have some. And he partakes of it as well. And herein lies when death has entered into the created order. There are really three types of death that the Bible makes very clear. Three types of death. First of all, the spiritual death. And that's what happens right here. They, they have lost their relationship, their close, perfect relationship with the one true God. They have lost it all in these few moments. Think of what they gave up just for a bite of fruit. Think what they gave up. They spiritually die, which of course, spiritual, when you're spiritually uh, dying, it always leads to physical death. Again, death was not a part of the original plan. I've said this often as I've dealt with the grief of my own, my own dad. And I look at brothers and sisters in Christ, and this is something I often share at Celebration of Life Services for brothers and sisters in Christ, is death is not something for us to get over. It's not even something that we really can get through. Why is that? We were not created to deal with death. And there's nothing in the Bible that says that God kind of on the back end after sin and death is present in the created order. There's nothing in the Bible that says that God kind of superintended some other quality that we could get over death. We were never meant to deal with it. That's why it hurts so much. That's why it hurts so much. And it will continue to hurt so much until Jesus returns. But not only spiritual and physical death, but ultimately eternal death, eternal separation. By the way... The Bible also doesn't give any sense that there is some sort of cessation of existence. At one point, there are people out there that call themselves Christians that believe when a person dies, if they're not in Christ, that they just cease to exist. That God basically, this is called annihilationism, and it is so wrong and so false. The moment that you were created, you were created forever. You, your, 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 your existence goes on forever. Now, you and I have the opportunity because of who we are in Christ to be in restored relationship. And we don't have to experience eternal death. But just as there is eternal life, there is eternal death. And eternal death is not defined as being in the ground. Eternal death is defined as being eternally separated from your creator. Please understand. But the corporate nature of sin. Now, now, I know what some of you, you men are thinking. You're saying, you know what? It's all his fault. I know, y'all, I know how y'all think. You men are thinking, yep, it was a woman's fault. Yep. And I know what y'all are thinking. You're going to go home and you guys are going to have a conversation about the sermon and say, you know, it's all Eve's fault. No, that's actually not what the Bible teaches. The Bible actually teaches that in Adam, all of mankind has sinned. Turn to Romans 5 real quick. I'm just going to read this over you real quick and drop some knowledge on you. Because I, I know some of you men, you're like me. You're, you're always looking for that next conversation where you can kind of, kind of get the one up. And this is one that we are going to lose. I'm just going to tell you, we're going to lose this because of what the Bible teaches. Look in Romans chapter 5 and go down to verses 12. Therefore, just as through one man, not one woman, by the way, look at verse 12 of Romans chapter 5. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So according to the Apostle Paul, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, who is God, where is the onus place? Why is sin in the created order? It is not woman. It's man. It's on you and I. We were always called to lead. Look at verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. Speaking of the second Adam. The good news is here in verse 15. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. And the gift is not that which came through one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression. Notice that. From the transgression of Adam, 
All the transgression of mankind arose from that one event all the way back there in the Garden of Eden, resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. We could go on, but you see, ultimately, man, man, we were the stewards, we were the overseers, we were the regents, we were the, 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 lower, the lower G, we were the governors of the created order. And even there at the beginning, we fail. We saw in our progenitor, our father, Adam, the first Adam, he fails. Our sin always it always alters. There's this kind of this, this, this cosmic, this cosmic effect that has happened. And, 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 and again, you and I, a demonstration of the depraved nature and the sin nature is that we minimize our sin. Okay? The fact that we minimize our sin is a fact, is a demonstration that sin is in you and I. We do it all the time. But you've, if, if we just look at the created order and we see all that has been, been changed as a result of sin... Death, ultimately. War, violence. The war over in, in uh, Ukraine and, and between Russia right now, that, that is a result of sin. Think of David. Think of the one there in the Old Testament we know as King David. And think about how his sin just compounded. Sin always compounds. It always compounds until you bring it before the Lord and you say, I have sinned. I don't deserve life. I don't deserve breath. And Lord, please save me and keep me. And he chooses to forgive us. This is good news for us. But we must acknowledge our sin. But we also have to acknowledge that our sin is never in a vacuum. It always impacts other people, even when we think we're by ourselves. Take that and tuck it away because I know that's important for all of us to hear. Not only a propensity to lie, listening, the sin nature brings about a problem in life, lostness. We are lost. We are, we are without an anchor in our sin. But the good news is we have Christ. But here we see in verses 9 through 13, a posture of love losing, a posture of love losing. Look at verses 9 through 13 of Genesis chapter 3. Then, the, then Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, where are you? So the fall has occurred. And they had, they're hiding themselves from Yahweh God. That has not happened to this point. And before they were in perfect relationship, they were inviting God. Every time that Yahweh walked and strolled through the garden, they were inviting that relationship. Now they are scared. They are guilty. They are full of shame. Then Yahweh God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Verse 11. And Yahweh said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Simple yes or no. And the man said to the woman, uh, said, and, and the man said, the woman, notice this is the first time in history that the man is going to cast blame on his wife. The man said, the woman who you gave to me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And there's actually a twofold blaming there. We'll talk about that in a second. Then Yahweh God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I... Now, on one level, this is Yahweh. He is omnipotent. He is all-knowing. Does he know that they have sinned? Absolutely. He's asking the questions for their benefit. He's not learning. He doesn't need knowledge. He already knows what has occurred. He knew what they would do before he created them. And yet here he is strolling through the garden. And we see love losing. Not only life lost, but love losing. This, this, this relationship, he continues to love us, and yet we go far from him. All of a sudden, there is shame and guilt, and it is impugning and hindering their ability to be in perfect relationship with a holy God. But I love the fact that God is pursuant immediately, the moment after they have fallen. There's, there's no sense in the text that there is much time that has elapsed from the fall until Yahweh is on the scene. And he is calling out in the garden for them. He is pursuing them immediately. And the heart and the mind of the sinner there in Adam is on full display. First of all, he is truly fearful. Sin brings about fear. It brings about doubt. It brings about half-truth, by the way. Sin kind of, a, kind of a, it makes us good liars. But again, that lie always compounds. 
We're always going to find ourselves spouting a half-truth, taking a little bit of kernel of the truth, and then stra- extrapolating from that. This is the mind and the heart and the sound of the voice of a sinner. Yahweh asked a very simple yes or no question. Did you eat? First of all, who told you that you were naked? In other words, that wasn't a problem before. Now it's a problem. Why are you worried about that? Did you eat of the fruit? Simple yes or no. And his response, Adam's response, is not to accept the blame for himself, knowing that he is the regent and the small g governor of the created order. He doubles down and he literally says the the construction in the Hebrew is like this. He says, there said the man, the woman. Okay? So his response is not to say, I did it. I'm guilty. I'm the one. Uh, It's my fault. That's what he should have said. He basically says, exhibit A, look at the woman who you gave me. In fact, this is actually a condom. This is, Adam is, in, in one breath, not only is he shaming his wife, he's condemning God and saying, the reason that I fell, this would not have happened if you would not have given me the woman. Be careful, Adam. Blame game. Blame to the woman, blame to Yahweh God. Blame shifting. This is the heart and the mind of the sinner. This is losing love. This is losing your potential to love the God who created you. This is losing perfect relationship. This is losing what you were created to do, to function in the way you were always meant to function, in a perfect, loving relationship where God loves you as creator and you you give that love back. Now, his love is infinite. He is the creator but there was a time before the fall where Adam and Eve, Adam and the woman, they, they loved Yahweh perfectly, however short that time may have been. And now the question is turned on Eve. So instead of addressing Adam forthwith, right there straight away, he turns right to, to the woman. He says, what is this that you have done? And Eve, taking her cues from Adam, from her husband, she's not really concerned with her own guilt and her own shame. The Hebrew construction of her response is very similar to what Adam has said. He says, the Bible says in the Hebrew construction, there said the woman, the serpent. So the man says, the man said, the woman. And then the woman's over here. The woman says, the woman said, the serpent. Everybody's deflecting. They're taking the blame. They're taking the guilt. They're taking the shame and they're They're pushing it. They're pushing it down, pushing it down the road. This is a posture of love losing. We have lost our capacity to love with the sin nature. Quickly, not only a propensity to lie listening, not only a problem in life lostness, not only a posture of love losing in the sin nature, but fourthly, a power under the Lord's lordship. This is good news. When it comes to sin nature as damaging and as destructive as it is, it is no match for the sovereign power of our God. Let me say that again. Sin is no match for the sovereign power of our God. We see the sin nature and we see the Lord's lordship on full display. He is Lord of all things. He is scared of nothing. And in fact, he can remedy all that he desires. And he so desires to remedy the fallen nature of mankind, the fallen nature of you and I. Look at verses 14 and 15, and we basically have the first gospel on display here. Uh, after, after the woman deflects just as, as the man has deflected, And the Lord God, Yahweh God, said to the serpent, now he is going to address. He doesn't ask the serpent any questions. Uh, Yahweh is already very well versed with Lucifer, the devil, the one that has fallen, the one that tried to, to raise up a coup in the heavenly realm. How absurd that the creatures would rise up against the creator. creator. And so the creator's response was just to throw them out of heaven and to cast them down to remind them that they're little cockroaches under his feet. And look at verse 14. He doesn't even ask a question. He just announces the curse to the serpent. And Yahweh God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field, or your body. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. That's interesting. 
on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. In verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, or the seed of the woman will crush you and crush your head, devil, enemy, and your own seed, and you shall bruise him, the seed of the woman, on the heel. And drop down to verse 21. And Yahweh God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. A power under the Lord's lordship. The sin nature is powerful. Yes, sin leads to your spiritual death, your physical death. It can, if you don't call on the name of Jesus Christ, it will lead to your eternal, eternal death. It will happen. But God has sovereign power over that. He demonstrates his lordship even over the sin nature. God is still over sin and death. All things because of the sin nature and sin cosmically infused into the created order. All things suffer, but Yahweh is sovereign over that. Demonstrating his sovereign power. Remember, sovereign, we often use that word and we apply it just to the doctrine of salvation. That certainly is part of it. But remember, sovereignty speaks to his lordship over all things. He is a king with a kingdom and he rules everything. Nothing is out of his expanse of control. Nothing can overpower him. Nothing confounds him. He is the almighty one. And he is even almighty over the sin nature. To the serpent, he tells the serpent that you are forever going to be on your belly. Martin Luther thought that this meant that perhaps that this creature that we call a serpent and a snake, perhaps it meant that maybe formerly it stood upright. I don't know about all that. But clearly there is something with the serpent that before it was very crafty, it was subtly slithering along and now the enemy chose the serpent to, to embody it and to use it as a vessel. And God cast judgment on the serpent. Not the serpent per se, not all snakes per se. I know some of y'all feel like snakes are a bane of our existence. But did you know without sin, even snakes would be good, okay? Even spiders would be good. Think about this, Oklahomans. Even ticks would be good if sin was not here. Mind blown. The curse. Notice the curse, not only to the devil, but also the curse of enmity, literally war. Look there. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head. Who's the he there? That's speaking of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman shall crush your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel, speaking perhaps quite clearly to the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Remember, this is, this is Christ in all the Old Testament. And can I tell you that Christ is right here at the beginning of all things in the Bible. All of the Bible is about our King, Jesus Christ. This is often called the Proto-Evangelium. This is the first gospel. Again, we Highlight Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the Gospels. The first Gospel is actually present all the way back here in Genesis chapter 3 because it tells us of this Messiah who has the power to conquer sin and death, to save us, to be the remedy, to be the Savior and Lord of our lives, to be our best friend. This is the one who comes for us. And this is good news. The seed of the woman is supreme, by the way. I know that we, again, see someone over there in Russia, uh, kind of a, a type of Antichrist. Some have said that. Is Putin the Antichrist? I, I don't think we're quite there yet. We've got some things that need to unfold a little bit more, but certainly he is a type of Antichrist. He has the heart and the mindset, the wickedness of Antichrist, and he wants to destroy all things, just as, just as the enemy wants to to to. to uh, take your depraved na nature, destroy you, and ultimately lead you to eternal death. That's what the enemy wants for you. But the Lord is sovereign in his lordship over even the sin nature. He can conquer this with the gospel. Jesus Christ, crucified Christ, risen for all of us. All that call on the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us, will be saved. Finally, the sin nature, a proficiency to leader limiting 
when you and I are kind of exuding that sin nature, it's so natural for us to forego and to put off the leadership of the Holy Spirit and the perfect relationship of God. Look at verses 16 through 20 quickly and we'll finish up. Looking at verse 16, to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband. That, 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 uh, that, that uh, word for desire there, yet your desire shall be for your husband. It, it, it actually, you can actually translate it as a pose. You'll be against, yet you're the construction of the text, you'll be against him. This wasn't natural before, but we see again the cosmic imbalance of sin infused, the taint of sin infused into the created order, even hurting the relationship of man and woman. Yet your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Before it would have been quite natural for the man to be in leadership. Now, now the woman is saying, I don't want that. I don't want that man to lead me. I want to lead myself. Then to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you and toil and you shall eat of it. Notice there's a curse to all three. There's a curse to all, to all participants except Yahweh himself. A curse to the enemy, the serpent, the curse to the woman, and a curse to the man. Then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and you have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life with thorns and thistles. It shall grow for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till, you're, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Now to the man called his wife, now the man called his wife, Eve, because she was the mother of all the living. As much as the enemy wants to bring death, God brings life. And God brings forth life uh, through the, the uh, copulation before, before the sexual intimacy, which is a good thing for Adam and Eve. He brings forth more life. Look at verses 22 through 24 to finish up. Then Yahweh God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now least... He stretch out his hand and take from the tree of life and eat and live forever. This is a gracious thing. Notice this. Therefore, Yahweh God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to cultivate. It's almost as if uh, God's saying here, if Adam and Eve have, have been left in the Garden of Eden and they could continue to partake of the tree of life, that they almost would have kind of stayed forever in kind of this state of of just perpetual sin and, and the fallenness of their own body. And we know that the Bible in the New Testament particularly tells us that even our physical bodies will be redeemed. We will have glorified, resurrected bodies in the likeness of Christ, the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim, a, an angel with a sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. This is a gracious thing, but we see the proficiency because of the sin nature to leader limiting. We don't want to follow God. And there are consequences when we do not follow God. Brethren, brothers and sisters in Christ, our God is over the sin nature. I pray that today you see the severity of your own sin nature, but you also see the glorious nature of a God who chooses to save you. Don't be, uh, don't be foiled. Don't, don't, don't diminish your own sin nature, it is great. It leads to your separation from a holy God. But in Christ, you can be redeemed. And we see it all the way back here in Genesis chapter 3, the very first gospel. The Bible tells us the Messiah shall crush, shall crush the head of the enemy. All the evil, all the sin, all the violence that we see in our world today, it will one day be over when Jesus returns he will crush the head of the enemy. Father God, we love you. We thank you for your truth. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Right now, Lord, we deal with the gravity of our own sin. Each one of us, myself included, we all minimize our sin. And yet it is, it is so terrible, it is so great that just one act of disobedience there back in the Garden of Eden has, has ransacked the world with violence, with lawlessness, with treachery, with atrocity, all because 
of sin. It is a big deal. But thank you, Father, that you have given us the sovereign Savior who is over sin. He has lordship over sin. He is stronger than our sin. Thank you, Father, for that truth. I pray that we delight in that truth today as we sing now here in a few moments, Lord. I just pray that there would be a, a, a spirit of release knowing that we are free in Christ. We are free indeed. Thank you, Father, for your son, the Messiah, who crushes the head of the enemy. In the name of Jesus, we pray all of God's people said. I'm going to ask you to stand right now during our time of invitation. This altar is open. This altar is open. We've dealt with some weighty things today. You come and you, you respond to the Lord as the Holy Spirit leads. If you do not, if you do not know Jesus Christ in a personal relationship, let me tell you how you can do that. You admit that you're a sinner. You admit that your sin is so egregious that it separates you from a holy God. And without calling on the name of Jesus Christ, you will be forever separated. But the Bible tells us if you call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. Believe in Jesus. You believe in his atoning work on the cross of Calvary for your sins. And on the third day, the Bible tells us he rose again. And now you're going to commit your life to the Lord Jesus. You can do that today. If you're a guest here today and you're a believer in Christ and you want to you come and you want to join this fellowship, we, we extend the hand of fellowship to you. We invite you into this body of Christ. Whatever the Holy Spirit is telling you to do right now, will you listen? Will you be obedient? Let's sing.